It, it is so great to be back. Last week I had an opportunity to uh, be up in Worcester, Ohio. Maybe some of you call it Worcester, but it's Worcester, Ohio, which is some incredible Amish country. And uh, the reason I had a chance to go up there is my brother is a preacher up there at Parkview Christian Church. So I had a chance to go up and just kind of share with him, which was kind of cool. Um, you know, I always give him a hard time because he's been, in the seven years we've had a church here, he's been down here, I think, to preach three times. In, in the nine years he's been there, he never had me up there once. So finally, I got a chance to make it up on the big stage there. But I know Robert last week did a fantastic job on preaching on the conscience of David and kind of laying out a scenario where David had an opportunity to make a poor choice, to make a bad decision, and he actually made a really good one. Uh, he, he decided that even though he was in a cave where he could have taken out King Saul, who was basically his enemy, because Saul had made it very clear that he wanted to kill David, that even though David was in there in the darkness of the cave, so close he could actually cut off the hem of his robe, uh, you know, or, or a swatch of his robe. Uh, he didn't, and he had all this pressure from his soldiers, you know, his, his band of brothers saying, come on, do it, man, do it. And he knew that the Lord had anointed him as the soon-to-be king of Israel. So he had all these excuses and all these opportunities to rationalize and justify why he could make this decision, but he chose to make a good decision. He chose to spare his life, even in spite of all of the temptation to probably do otherwise. Now, I just want to ask you. Have you ever been in a situation where you had this inner dialogue going on in your head or this inner conflict wrestling with you in trying to figure out, you know, should I or should I not do this? You know, you've seen the cartoon where there's always that little, that, that, that devil over here and the angel over here saying, come on, you can do it. No, you shouldn't do it. Any, anybody ever wrestled with anything? Am I the only one? Okay, just three or four of you. That's great. The rest of you, I'm glad you're here because uh, you're in denial. But anyway... The, the reality is we, we all have these situations where we're wrestling, should I or shouldn't I? And uh, last week I had a situation where I had a tough decision to make. And, and it's something that I could do it or I could not do it. You see, my mom, uh, knowing that I was going to be preaching at Brian's church, wanted the two of us to wear matching shirts. Okay? And, and so she bought these matching shirts for us because she thought it would be a good idea for us to match while we were up there, you know. And so I was wrestling with that decision because I'm saying that should I do this or should I not do this? Because mom wasn't going to be there. She might never know, you know. That's what I was thinking. Or, you know, I could have accidentally forgot the shirt at home. It's three and a half hours away. Or I could have said, you know what, mom, after further review, it didn't fit well, so I, I, I'm going to take it back. Or I could have even said, you know what, I wanted to, but Brian didn't want to, so it was all Brian's fault. You know, uh, I could have done a lot of that, and, and, and I come up with a lot of excuses of, of whether I should match or not a match, whether I should obey or not obey, but I'm happy to report that because I love and honor and respect my mom, and I'm speaking, I'm speaking for me, um, and because I knew that she had planted someone in the audience to check up on us, because... Uh, so we decided to match, and we matched as best we could. And, and it just goes to show that even though my mom was down here three-plus hours away, uh, the force is very strong. You know what I'm saying? Because she knows a guy who knows a guy who knows another guy, if you know what I mean. So we ended up doing this. And, and I'm sharing this story uh, knowing that when I made that decision, I was going to get laughed at. We were going to get made fun of in front of all these people. But we made the choice. We did it. And uh, you know, I know a lot of you right now are thinking, but that's easy for you. You're the preacher. Preachers always make all the right decisions. I know that's what you're thinking about me right now. But I want to tell you, it was not easy. Because uh, there was one time we were cornered by two third grade girls that were laughing at us and just making us uh, feel bad. It's like they were the fashion police that day, you know. And they're just, uh, that doesn't really match. Your shoes aren't the same. I mean, just letting us have it. And, and, and it wasn't easy. I was very tempted to cave. I was very tempted to take off my shirt and just wear the white T-shirt that was underneath. But, but I, I, I fought through it. And, you know, you think that the bullying was just there. Here's the reality. There was also bullying going on down here as well, all these years, all these miles away. And, and so to protect the identity of this one person on social media who bullied us, I went ahead and crossed out their name. But look what they said. Looks, it looks like Tweedledee and Tweedle, hmm, dynamic, I'm thinking is what you, Tweedledee and twi Tweedle dynamic. But anyway, um, so in spite of the pressure, I'm really glad that uh, I, I did what I should have done and that Brian and I matched because we obeyed our mom. And uh, we'll do it again if mom asks, but other than that, you know, so where, where was I? Oh, about making good decisions, about making good conscientious decisions and 
Last week, Robert covered one where David made a good one. Uh, Today, I'm going to cover a story that many of you, again, know about because it is an absolute train wreck. It is a train wreck. I'm going to talk about a chain of wrong decisions that, that David, a man after God's own heart made, that created this disastrous train wreck. You know, a couple weeks ago, we were talking about, you know, David, the giant slayer. Today, I'm going to talk about giant, the player. You know, David's the player. David would fit really, really well in our climate today. You know, our grocery stores, our news, our, our, our Twitter, all that blows up whenever a politician, a priest, a preacher, a coach, a teacher, whenever there's some sort of moral failure... We just can't get enough. What, what happened? What did they do? And we, we, we just dial it in. And other than Adam and Eve's epic fail, I would say David's probably comes in second place of being one of the most familiar epic failure when it comes to a decision. Warren Wiersbe, a commentator, said, I'm so glad we get to see the rest of David's life play out because today when someone falls from grace, we don't always get to hear about the restoration we just focus on the collapse. And again, I always say this, for those of you who want to question the authority or question the, the scriptures, you know, it, it, the, the, the Bible never flatters the people that, that we consider heroes. When we look at Hebrews chapter 11, the Faith Hall of Fame, and we look at all these people we put up on a pedestal, you know, we think, oh, well, they, they, they had it easy. No, the Bible never flatters them. As a matter of fact, nobody comes out of this smelling like a rose except for Christ. Jesus is the only one who seemed to be able to, while he was tempted in every way, overcome those temptations. So the Bible does not flatter its heroes. Someone said when the Holy Spirit paints a portrait of their lives, if you really read the entire account of their lives... You see that it's real. It's authentic. The Bible doesn't ignore or deny or overlook or try to cover up someone else's dark side. We see it. And and I think maybe that's a reminder so that when we're reading this, before we start thinking, well, they had it so easy, or well, if I'd have been hanging around Jesus, I would have done this or that too. I I think the reminder is the reason we, when you read this, is so it reminds us that no one is immune from sin. No one is immune from sin. It also tells us that there is no sin that is too great for the love, the mercy, and forgiveness of God. But the point is, no one is immune from sin. I heard that when Pope John Paul II died, a man by the name of Rogers Cadenhead quickly registered the web address, www.benedict16th.com, thinking this might be the name chosen by the next pope. Well, when Cardinal Ratzinger was elected pope, he did choose the name Pope Benedict XVI, causing some to question whether the Vatican would, what they would do in order to purchase that domain from Rogers Cadenhead. And Cadenhead didn't ask the Vatican for money. Instead, in a blog... He suggested a few things that he would trade that domain for. First of all, he said, I will give you that domain for three days and two nights at the Vatican Hotel. I will give you that domain if, if you get me one of those hats, you know, the hats, like the, the, the bishop had worn. And then he says, and I will give you that domain if you will give me complete absolution, no questions asked, for the third week of March, 1987. What in the world did he do on the third week of March, 1987? That he would go through all that trouble, that he wants absolution, no questions asked, for that entire week. Well, today I think what we're going to see here is King David had a third week of March in his life. And we can learn a lot. We can learn a lot by watching David and the the decisions that he made, the, the conscious decisions that he made and we can learn from that and what's interesting is you know we learned from David and how we can defeat the giants well now today I think what we're going to learn is how we can be overcome and defeated by the giants in our lives so what I want you to do is turn to 2nd Samuel 
2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 27. I'm not going to read through all 27 verses, but if you have the Bibles in front of you, that you'll find on page 270. But we're just kind of going to walk through this account. So turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 27. You can also find it on your app or your smartphone. Verse 1, in the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. So right away, we see the very first critical misstep. You see, he wasn't, he, he wasn't where he was supposed to be. It said after, you know, it said that after a lot of great success, usually right after a lot of great success comes a major fail. And that's exactly what we see happens here with David. David was the greatest of kings of Israel. He ruled over the largest territorial reign in history. His kingdom prom- or prospered it, it, like in no time ever again. And, and life was so good, he was at an all-time high when it came to popularity. But we see his first lapse in judgment because he stayed behind while all the others around him went to war. So just curious, anyone ever get in trouble because you were not where you were supposed to be? I mean, just out of curiosity, if we're going to go with a percentage of time, what is the percentage? And don't raise your hands here, all right? Or don't look at your spouse or whoever's sitting next to you and say, yeah, I remember that one. But, But percentage of time. That you usually make a critical mistake or make a stupid decision. What is the percentage of time that it's because you are where you should not be? Or watching what you should not watch? Or doing what you should not do? I would say it's a pretty, pretty strong high percentage. And How many times... When you think of some of the greatest regrets in your life, and I think we've all had that third week in March, how many of those times when you play that regret out in your mind, it started because you were not where you were supposed to be? I would say it's pretty high. And so the first mistake we see with David is he was not doing what he was supposed to be doing. I mean, if he was like all of the other kings, he'd be with his troops. But now he chose to sit this one out. And because he set this one out, what he's going to be doing down the road is what we do a lot when we're not where we should be. I would have, should have, could have. If I would have, I should have, if I only could have. And you see that regret playing out in his mind. The second mistake we see that he makes is not only he was not where he should have been, but he was bored. When he should have been busy in battle... He's laying around in bed, bored, watching Netflix. (laughs) Second Samuel 11, verse 2. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of his palace. So he was just bored. He didn't have anything better to do, so I think I'll take a stroll. Mistake three. He looked too longingly. Or he looked again and again and again. Because we see in the second part of verse 2, as he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. Now, I looked at the original language of what translates from unusual beauty, and the original language means smoking hot. She was smoking hot, all right? That's the original language. But if he would have just went, sorry, and backpedaled, if he just would have backed away, if he just would have went back inside to watch another episode of whatever he was watching on Netflix, he could have avoided a lot of this. But apparently he took enough time to notice she was not only bathing, but she was unusually hot. She was beautiful. Steve Arterburn of New Life Ministries, he uses the term a lot, bounce the eyes. Bounce the eyes. He should have bounced his eyes. He should have went, ah, oh, that's a beautiful scenery. That's beautiful. Oh. Bounce the eyes. He says, when you bounce your eyes away from a sexual image, you immediately pull from your memory a pure image. Maybe a wedding picture or a vacation experience with your family or your buddies. There are a thousand positive images you can pull from your memory within seconds to replace the sexual image that you are now being tempted with. You see, if maybe if he would have bounced his eyes 
Maybe instead of seeing a woman taking a bath, if instead he would have thought, you know what, I wonder how long it's been since all my troops out there fighting for me have been since they've taken a bath. I bet that would have thrown some cold water on the situation. If instead of looking at her and really longingly look at her, instead bounce the eyes and think about, oh, I shouldn't be doing this, or I wonder what's going on on the front, he didn't do it. Because if he'd have done that, it may have put a halt to what happens next. Mistake number four. He thinks, you know what, I need to get a little bit more information on the girl next door. I don't really know who she is. I'd like to get to know her. So he sends someone in verse 3 to find out who she is. At this point, he's in trouble. Because he's already planning. He's already plotting. He's in trouble. You know, he could have stopped before this point and said, you know what, forgive me, Lord. I shouldn't have looked at that. I shouldn't have thought of her. I, he should have. He could have said, forgive me for my lustful thoughts, but no, now he is planning it, he is plotting it, and he's even going through the trouble to send somebody over to find out who she is. And that leads to the next mistake he makes. He blows through another set of flashing lights because one brave servant went to check out who this person was, and he tries his best to not disappoint the king. So he goes to get the information. But he very bravely says something in a certain way that would have been, again, another set of flashing lights. Because here's the interesting thing. Whenever you read the Old Testament, New Testament, read throughout, you'll always see that they'll identify someone as the son of. This person was the son of. The son of. Matter of fact, if you look up Bible Gateway and you type in son of, you'll find over a thousand references where such and such was the son of this person. And I find it interesting. This servant comes back and says, I found out what you want to find. She's Bathsheba. The daughter of Eliam, so far following the plan. But then he throws in, and the wife of Uriah. So she's the daughter of Eliam, but she's also, may I emphasize this, the wife of. But David again runs through the flashing lights. And he says, you know what, I'd like to meet her. So go get her. Bring her here to me. And so he sends a messenger to get her. And when she came back to the palace, he slept with her. How'd that happen? You see, it's amazing how David, the man who was anointed by God to be the next king of Israel, David, the man who spent time singing songs about God in the pastures and writing psalms as he's overlooking the flock, David, who was the one who says, I can take him. Our God, he will take him. And by the end of this day, you're going to be done. So, so David, the man who was able to charge the giant that everyone was cowering in fear, that, gay, that David. The David who made a great decision in not being impatient and taking the life of King Saul, that David. That David was also the man who slept with another man's wife. And who knows how many times. From the moment he saw her in that bathtub, taking a bath, had he slept with her in his mind time and time and time again before she ever crossed the threshold into his palace. How many times had he already been there? Again, in the book, Every Man's Battle, Arthur Byrne writes, For males, impurity of the eyes is sexual foreplay. And foreplay, foreplay is any sexual action that naturally takes us down the road to intercourse. Foreplay ignites passions, rocketing us by stages until we go all the way. And God views foreplay outside of marriage as wrong. It's critical to recognize visual sexual impurity as foreplay. And that's exactly where he was. He had already played it out in his mind. It, it wasn't a matter of if anymore. It was just a matter of when how can I make this happen? So he sleeps with her. It goes on and says that she had just completed the purification rites after her period. And then she returned home. And later when Bathsheba discovered she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. Now, I just want to review up to this point some of the poor decisions that he has made. Because again, I think we can learn an awful lot by looking at the decisions he made, it's some of the ways that we make the same decisions. Maybe not the same scenario, but how we do the very same things that get us into the same mess. First of all, he wasn't where he should have been. And he wasn't busy, he was idle, he was bored. 
And I don't know about you, but when I'm bored, when I'm sleepy, when I'm hungry, when I'm coming off of a pretty good season in my life, that seems to be when I'm always the most vulnerable. And he was bored. And then he looked, and he looked longingly, and he lingered, and then he's lusting after her, and then he's just setting up the encounter. You see, he saw her, he studied her, he sent for her, he slept with her, and he sinned on many, many levels. But here's the amazing thing. That would be enough. I mean, that is already a train wreck. But no, David goes farther. Now he decides, I need to cover that up. I need to make sure that nobody finds out. So he sends word to Joab, and he says, send me Uriah the Hittite, you know, the one on the front lines who's fighting where I should be. Go send for him. And so when Uriah arrives, David asked him how Joab and the army were getting along and how the war is progressing. So, hey, sit down. How's the weather? So how's things going up there? Hey, did you see that game the other night? That was something else. I mean, he's just having a conversation with this guy. And I'm sure Uriah's thinking, wow, I've got an audience with the king. Wow, I mean, how cool is this? Of all the people that he could have, he, he's got me and he's sitting down. He's actually asking my opinion on some things. And then he told Uriah, you know what, I'll tell you what, why don't you go home and relax? David even sent a gift to Uriah after he'd left the palace. But Uriah didn't go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. And when David heard that Uriah had not gone home, he summoned him and asked, what's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night after being away for so long? I mean, come on, you're a guy, right? Don't you miss her? Why wouldn't you go home? And Uriah replied, the ark and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents, and Joab and my master's men are camping in the open fields. How could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I could never. I would never do such a thing. So David's grand plan already was failing. So he had to come up with a different tactic. So he says, I'll tell you what. Why don't you stay here today, and tomorrow you may return to the army. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next, and then David invited him to dinner, and David got him drunk. But even then, he couldn't get Uriah to go home to his wife. Again, he slept at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. Now, I find that very fascinating. I just want you to you know, because we really hold David up to such a high pedestal, but I want you to think about this. I want you to notice that Uriah has more character and integrity while drunk than David had when he was sober. This man's drunk and has more integrity and more character than the sober king. Any king in their right mind would love to have an army filled with men like Uriah. But as we're going to see, David was not in his right mind. You, you may have heard, it's been in the news just the last few days since Open Day. There was a little bit of an incident that took place down at the Sky Wheel down at the banks, all right? Now, I'm not going to describe it to you. If you know nothing about what I'm saying, first of all, you've looked at not any news network or the newspaper since then. But let's just say that something went on down at the Sky Wheel around opening day, and it was a bit obscene, and it was a bit inappropriate, and they got busted for it, and they got arrested for it. And the only reason I'm sharing this with you is because, not because I want to give you any details, but I'm going to be very delicate. But the reason I want to share this with you, because I, I, the quote from the Sky Star Wheel manager just really caught me. Todd Snyder said of the incident, the couple who was doing something extremely indecent and inappropriate, the couple made eye contact and continued doing what they were doing. And then he says, they weren't thinking correctly. Well, I guess not. They weren't thinking correctly. They made eye contact with us, but they kept doing what they were doing because they weren't thinking correctly. And I'm thinking to myself, David is making eye contact with Uriah the Hittite over and over again for days. He's making eye contact with this man. But he's obviously not thinking correctly. Because look what happens next. The next morning, David writes a letter to Joab and gives it to Uriah. 
to deliver. And the letter instructed Joab, I want you to station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is the fiercest. I want you to put him on the tip of the spear. And then I want you to pull back so that he will be killed. So Joab assigned Uriah the spot close to the city wall where he knew the enemy's strongest men were fighting. And when the enemy soldiers came out of the city to fight, Uriah the Hittite was killed along with several other Israelite soldiers. It's amazing that David trusted Uriah so much, he actually sent him with the letter that was going to order his death. And this man had so much integrity, he obviously didn't worry about him opening it up. Didn't worry about him reading it. Little did Uriah know that his honor as a soldier would end up costing him his life by order of his king. And I also want you to notice that David's sinful actions also devastated other families as well. So not only did he ruin Uriah's family, but there were other soldiers who were killed as well. Other soldiers whose wives became widows and children became orphans. All because he wasn't thinking correctly. And so we see mistake number eight. And this is hard for us to imagine that David... King David, who we think is, wow, what an example. But what we see is King David became a cold-hearted killer. This entire sequence, if you really count it up, David violated and broke almost every commandment. As a matter of fact, I think he might have went for the sweep. All in one third week of March, if you know what I mean. I mean, look, look, Jay Oswald says it this way. It's been pointed out that the breaking of the 10th commandment, which is coveting your neighbor's wife, led to his breaking of the 7th commandment, which is committing adultery. Soon, in trying to avoid breaking the 8th, which was stealing what did not belong to him, he broke the 6th and committed murder to cover it up. He broke the 9th by bearing false witness against his neighbor. In other words, he lied. He brought dishonor on his parents by breaking the 5th. And thus he broke all the commandments which refer to one's loving one's neighbor as oneself. And of course, the very nature of sin completely dishonors God, who's all about the first four commandments as well. That's a pretty rough week. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Now, if you were with us from the very beginning of why David was sought out and anointed by Samuel, you know it's because God was very displeased with Saul. And now we see that what David did displeased the Lord. Now, I would love for this message to end on a good note. I really would. I I really wish I could turn this thing, since we're talking about his compromise, in a better way. But I can't. And, And here's why I can't. And here's something that we all need to know. Sin, while it may be fun for a time, and while we may think we're getting away with it for a time, sin never ends well. There is not a happy ending with sin. So I can't polish this up. I can't, I can't sugarcoat it at all. And, and here's the thing. While we're focusing right now on David's story, the reality is it could be your story and my story very easily. I mean, really. We're talking about David, but I could be talking about me. And I might be talking to you because it's our story as well. And maybe our sin hasn't taken us down the same path, but I guarantee you this, our sin has taken us, period. It has taken us. You see, this is a story that's all about sin. And sin, as you, you, you may or may not know, just basically means to miss the mark 
and the mark is the, the holiness and the purity that God, what God wants for us, what God's desire for us is every time we sin is we are not pursuing what he desires for us. I'm pursuing what I desire for me. And when, when I desire is in contrast with what he desires, that's a sin. So when he wants me to do this, but I do that, I'm sinning. It could be a sin that I'm committing, or it could be even a sin of omission, where it is that I'm just not doing what he wants me to do. Because there are things that he wants me to do. I'm like, nope, not going to do it, not, not doing it. Well, then I am not pursuing what he desires for me, so therefore I am sinning. So the point is, while we may not be going down the same path, maybe while our train wreck doesn't model exactly his train wreck, we've all had a third week of March. All of us. And it is not a happy ending. And this story shows us that sin has consequences. And David's sin impacted more people than he ever would have imagined. Here he thought it was just going to be a fun night that turned into, uh-oh, to turned into I'm pregnant, to uh, turned into, well, if I could get him to sleep with you, I could cover it up and we'll just go on like nothing ever happened. But then that didn't work, so now i got to kill the guy. And because I not only tried to kill him, there were other people who got killed as well. And you'll find out if you read the rest of his story, he lost a child. I mean, there, there were so many consequences This story also shows how deceptive sin is. Here's the thing. David didn't wake up and say, man, I'm going I'm to do some things that's going to lead me to killing a guy. He just didn't wake up that day saying, that's what I'm going to do. This is my plan. He kind of slid into it. Started out by just being not where he shouldn't have been. He was not where he should have been. And then the next thing you know, he's lusting. And then... He's committing adultery, not only in the mind and in the heart, but physically. And then he's trying to be deceptive about it, trying to lie, trying to cover it up. And then he commits murder. And all the time, he has no idea the slippery slope because he's not thinking correctly. I had a friend who was sharing that he had a friend who was in ministry who just felt like God was calling him to leave his wife to be with another woman, though he was married. And I don't forget what my friend said. My friend looked at him and said, well, congratulations, because you are the only person in all of humanity where God has said for you to commit adultery on your wife. So you should feel honored. Can you even imagine to say that statement with a straight face? But I feel like God is calling me to do this rather than that. Because it, it feels good. I mean, come on, what could be so harmful about it? We're not thinking correctly. Eugene Peterson says this, David didn't feel like a sinner when he sent for Bathsheba. He felt like a lover. And what could be better than that? And David didn't feel like a sinner when he sent for Uriah. He felt like a king. What can be better than that? You see, there's a lot of things that we can do that can make us feel a certain way. And man, what can be better than that? And then we realize that that could not be worse. And the deceptiveness of sin, quite honestly, is it doesn't feel bad when we're doing it. I mean, come on. If sin was always painful, miserable, terrible on the front end, we wouldn't be doing it. But it's always going to be comfortable. It's always going to feel nice. It's always going to be right. It's going to feel so right. It's like a religious experience. Man, I mean, this is so good. I mean, why would God create something so bad? It's got to be good. It's so fulfilling. It's so satisfying. It's what I need. It's what I want. It's what I, not what he. The best way I could describe it is I was trying to think of how I could describe the process of how sin, just a little sin, can start to harden our heart to where we can go from here to way over here and not even notice how we got there. 
anybody ever been swimming at the ocean? Anybody, anybody? Show of hands. If you swim in the ocean. So, so for those of you who have seen this, you'll know what I'm talking about. When I was, when I was little, we'd go to this beach in, in South Carolina. And early on, I learned something that I didn't know at the time. And that is, as you're playing, every time you're lifting up, you're trying to go over the waves. You're trying to do all that stuff. As you're playing, as you're bouncing up and down, the waves are going to carry you farther down the beach. But when you're little, you don't know that. And so you're just having fun. You're just enjoying yourself. And you're just, you know, hey, what's going on? And then you turn around and say, hey, mom, watch me. And then you realize, mom's not there. Where'd she go? Where did she go? I don't see the blanket. I don't see the picnic basket. Where is she? And you're panicked because you don't see her in front of you anymore because she's left. And what you realize is, no, that's not what's happened. The tide has taken you farther down the beach. She didn't leave. I did. And the reason I did is because I did not keep my feet permanently I didn't keep my feet on the ground. So every time I lifted my feet, I would float a little farther. Every time I lifted my feet, I would float a little farther. But if I kept my feet grounded on the sand, I wasn't moving. And if I kept my eyes locked at all times on my family, I wouldn't lose sight of where that blanket was. And I think that's what happens with us when we sin. Is we don't keep our feet grounded in the word of God. We just start playing with it a little bit and before you know it we have coasted down farther and farther away from him and we haven't kept our eyes on him instead we've kept our eyes on what makes me feel good what I think what I want you see sin has the same subtlety and if we don't keep our eyes grounded on the word and our eyes on him we very easily will follow the same path. You see, part of our mess is we can't see our mess. Sometimes we can't even smell our mess because we become desensitized to it, immune to it. Someone else walks up and says, oh my gosh, what happened to you? I'm like, nothing, what? what are you talking about? I'm fine. Oh, no, you're not. But here's the good news, and I do want to finish with this. Because there is good news. And, and next week, I want you to come back. Because next week, David's going to be confronted with this. And I want you to see how he responds when he is confronted to this compromise, this sin that he's found himself in. And I really feel like you need to hear it. So this is kind of like a part two. But I want you to know this. That Jesus is in this story. Eugene Peterson says, when we sin and mess up our lives, we find that God doesn't go off and leave us. He enters into our trouble. And saves us. That's the truth. That's the truth. So while we all have that third week in March, it could be covered. It could be made right again because of Jesus. You see, Jesus gave his life, Jesus spilled and shed his blood so that my sins can be covered, can be washed clean. And so every single one of us who've had a third week of March or every single one of us who have not been thinking too correctly have an opportunity to have that all washed clean, forgiven and forgotten. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far God will remove our sins from him. And so that is the good news. So while sin doesn't end well, I can tell you it doesn't have to end there. Jesus gave his life so that you will not end with a life of sin. You will end having your sin washed clean by what he did. So I'm going to ask you to uh, stand with me, and I'm going to pray. But as I pray, I just kind of want to ask you a couple things. And I want you to spend some time honestly thinking about this. Right now in your life, are you someplace where you should not be? Are you where you shouldn't be right now? Are you bored? Are you tired? Are you coming off of this peak where, man, life just can't be better? Because if you're there, I can tell you it won't be long before you're here. Are you looking at things you shouldn't be looking at? Are you ignoring the flashing red lights and the exit ramps that God is giving you to keep you from following this path of destruction? 
And if you answered yes to those questions, then what are you going to do to change that? Because it's not going to end well for you. And if you're someone that's here that feels like, man, I've messed up way too much. No, you haven't. Jesus took care of that. Jesus took care of that. And I don't care how good and how gifted you think you are at sinning, his death covered that. He covered it. So I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. And then I'm just going to ask you to respond. And it could be in your seat or it could be coming forward. It could be coming to the crosses. But I'm just going to ask you to respond. So pray with me. God, every single one of us are commandment breakers. Every single one of us are self-centered. It's hard for us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And quite honestly, for some of us, we don't even love ourselves. And so there's so much that are stacked against us. But you knew that. your sovereignty you knew that so you put in place a plan you put in place a way for us to have all of that go away and so with your incredible grace and mercy and love you sent your son Jesus Christ to pay my price for the penalty of my sins and to pray for the penalty of every sin that's been committed by those who are standing here right now and the only thing that's keeping me from having a good ending a great ending or having a bad one is whether I accept that free gift of Jesus Christ your son or not so God I pray that every single one of us will be able to answer that question and I pray this in his name